Thank you very much, Andre. Um, thank you for inviting me. This is my third Sensations talk. So it's very nice to be back at the Sensations for a gap of four years. And the topic of my talk, which would be very useful for your projects if you listen to it, <laughs> because I can assure you that your presentations would be more successful thanks to the experience of listening to this. So, uh, the title of the talk is Experiences in Crowd Sensing for Environmental Monitoring. So, and I'm from the University of Edinburgh, from the School of Informatics. I'm a computer scientist by background. And, um, yeah. So, um, here's the overview of the talk. And, um, so I'll start off by making a problem statement as to what is crowd sensing? What is it that we, um, that I'm going to describe in this talk? Um, <clears throat> and give you some background on, on this terminology that you see, speckled computing. Now this term was coined in 2002 when the Internet of Things that described the same thing, the Internet of Things meant something else. Um, you need a bit of history lesson, because the original term, Internet of Things, was coined, I think, in 99 or 2000 by people in Procter & Gamble for a completely different reason. Because Procter & Gamble, as you know, is an American company which manufactures uh, toothpaste and soaps and washing powder and things of that sort. And they had a large warehouse inventory control issue. And someone very cleverly said, oh, there are these new things called RFIDs. And can we sort of put RFIDs on these uh, soap boxes and uh, scan them as they come in to the, um, to the warehouse so that they could automatically have uh, an inventory control system? And they coined the term Internet of Things for that. And then it was quiet for some time. And then in 2007, or 6 or 7, the EU were very keen to have a name for the next generation of Internet, they called it Internet of Things. So we started this in 2002 to mean about the same thing, we called them speckled computing, because specs are these tiny devices. It was a play on the smart dust, which is taking place at UC Berkeley, the project called Smart Dust, which um, some of you would have heard of, where they had tiny devices, but they mainly came from the MEMS background, you know, they were keen to have tiny devices which could communicate usually using optical communication with a base station, with a sensor or two in there. Whereas what we wanted to look at is sensors on the devices, the sensors, the processing which takes place on the device itself, and wireless networking, and they're autonomous, in other words, they have their own uh, um, on battery. Okay, so that was the term. A network of these was called a spec net, and spec computing is the computation which takes place on these devices in a distributed fashion. And we call that spec computing. And the fact that a number of these are connected all the internet meant that you you are kind of extending the internet to the last few centimeters. As well. Okay, so that's the the history behind that. So, I'll say something about that, and then there are two projects which, uh, which kind of exemplifies for us the, the idea of crowd sensing and how we can use the wisdom of the crowd to extract information. Okay, so the crowd in some senses are passive observers, they are the ones who are carrying the sensors with them, but by bringing data from a number of different sources, and by analyzing the data, you are extracting information which is useful for the, uh, for the crowd, in a sense. So, um, and it's called MyQ, that's how we pronounce this, MyQ, but it really stands for My Quality of Environment. So the idea here is that people carry sensors in them, and they upload data from the sensors, and the sensors have metadata associated with each one of them, which is time, temporal information, and spatial information, which is location where the data was sensed. Okay, and um, 
We'll, we'll talk about that, the MyQ project. And the second one is a project uh, funded uh, by EU and the project called Planet, which is an FP7 IP project. And I call this Horse Sense. And the idea here is that um, there is a um, there is a large herd of horses in southwest Spain called Ruterta horses. And these are wild horses. These are the last, the last breed of wild horses in Europe. The ones that you have in command, you know, these are cousins of those horses up there. So these are in southwest Spain, near Seville, in a place called Doniana National Park. And these horses are, are very precious. They're very precious because um, there are very few of them left, only about 200, and the numbers were dwindling. So the biologists would like to know more about the environment in which these horses inhabit, and something about the social behavior of the horses. So where do the horses spend time? Which other horses do they spend time with? And that's useful, knowing the location so that you can manage this uh, um, national park, and also Look at the spread of disease in these horses, because there are very limited numbers of these horses. It's very important that we understand the behavior of these horses so that you can look after them well. But very importantly, you let them roam in the wild, because the last thing you want to do is to domesticate these horses. You don't want to put them in a zoo. You don't want to put them in a, um, you know, enclose them with, uh, um, with kind of fences and things of that sort. You want to let them roam in their natural habitat and let them grow in numbers, but at the same time you'd like to know more information about them, which is not possible by just by visual inspection. You can't get a person just with binoculars washing them and following them all the time. It's just not practical. So these are two very different examples, but in some senses um, they are related in some ways. And they're related, first of all, in the use of sensors in order to extract data, uh, in order to sense data and extract information from these, uh, uh, in both of these projects. But obviously they have very different applications. So, so the other thing is these are real implementations, real data that I'm talking about. So these are experiences of literally sensors in the wild in this case. Okay. Um, and then I'll have some conclusions and future work. And some lessons, some high-level lessons that we learned by doing these things. Okay. Um, so these are the acknowledgements of the different projects. Also, like to acknowledge the people who worked on these projects at Edinburgh, uh, Yannick Mann and Emilian Radoy, uh, and at uh, Seville at the Doniana National Park, uh, Mara Malero, and lots of other people who have been involved in other aspects of this. Uh, of these projects. So the first two were in the Hossens project and the rest of them was in, were in the MyQ project there. Okay, so um, this shows you something more about the planet itself. It's a large IP project which is coming to an end uh, in December of this year and involving partners from several universities and companies where you're, you're kind of uh, using a number of different technology in order to sense these wild animals and also sense UAVs and the use of UA UAVs to extract data from many of these sensors. So, so those are the partners. So let me say a few things about the Center for Special Computing itself. Uh, this is based in the School of Informatics at the University of Edinburgh and we have two parts to this. We do basic research uh, and also we have something called the Special Computing Application Center where the second project, MyQ, is based. And um, so, so that's where it's at. So the first thing we look at is the um, crowd sensing. You know, um, so what I've put up here is the text which I sent Serjan way back in April as to what this project is going to, what this talk is going to be about. So I think it's useful to, to look at this because uh, what I really want to do is to compare the experiences of two crowd sensing projects which, although seemingly different, have a common purpose. And the common purpose is sourcing data to inform conservation of endangered species, 
and learn about the environment which they inhabit. So in both of these, I'd like to think that even mankind is in danger in some senses, if we continue the way we are. Okay, so uh, not just the horses. And um, so in the first case, it's uh, these wild horses which roam under the protective watch of the wardens in this uh, Doliana National Park. And um, what we want to do is they use body-worn sensors to monitor personal exposure to particulates in the second one. Okay, um, and what you're sensing here is particulates which are uh, small uh, matter which is about anywhere between 15 microns in size and diameter to what, 1 micron in size. And these are the outputs of your exhaust, the outputs of your factories, output of uh, burning wood. Um, so these are the results of uh, mainly human activity. You know, industrial activity with, that um, that we engage in. So um, we produce gases such as carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, which um, if consumed uh, or inhaled over a period of time has a detrimental effect on our health. We know that uh, a lot of clinical studies have been conducted where these particulates and these gases affect um, the cardiovascular system. It uh, produces respiratory problems. So we know that for a period of time, there is a certain harmful effect. So, um, and it's used to map the quality of environment in public spaces and based on numerous um, sort of personal exposures. So, so that's the outline of the, of the talk. And this is what you want to avoid. You know, this is, you might think, is an extreme case. What you see on the top uh, half of the figure is two um, pictures taken of the same location at different times on a clear day and on a day where there is heavy smog, and that's in Beijing, right? That might seem like an extreme case, and you know, as a person, when you have something like this, that you take precautions, you know, you have your face mask here. So you protect yourself uh, against these, the idea being that you have a filter in there and you're able to filter some of the gases. But the real problem is when you don't have this extreme case, that during everyday life, when it reaches a certain level above what is the normal level, you are inhaling these gases all the time. And it's the prolonged exposure to these gases that affect people. But it affects people even more if you're in at risk category, if you have conditions such as asthma and things of that sort. And if you have conditions like that, then you would like to know um, whether the condition is getting worse even before it affects you, so that you can take the precautions. Or if you're making a journey into the center of town, you can decide whether it's a good day to go in or whether you should sort of pull back. Okay? So that's the reason for doing it. So this is the, this is the motivation. And for, that's for the MyQ project. And this one is for the Horse Sense project. So this, this is a sort of an image of the wild Rutesa horses in Spain. And this is an example of some domesticated horses where you see these sensors. So these are the kinds of sensors I'm talking about which are um, which are placed on the collar of these uh, of these horses so that they don't come in the way. And they have to be light enough. And because these are endangered species, they're very careful that you don't do anything which would uh, make their life uncomfortable. So there are strict, stringent requirements on the weight and the size of these sensors. And given that we need to sense them for a period of 12 months, and you don't have any recourse to recharging it or catching the horse again, which means that uh, it is uh, technically a very challenging problem to have to run these things on such a battery with a sort of small size, but you need a very good energy density, and then you need good algorithms and good protocols so that you run them over a period of 12 months. So there are a number of technical challenges that we need to address in order to make this happen. So, um, crowd sensing. So let me, let me give you an example of uh, 
uh, sort of going back in time as to how uh, this, what is the concept underlying this. So there is this uh, idea of a panopticon. Panopticon was a term which was which is coined in the 19th century by a philosopher and a social scientist called Jeremy Bentham at the University College of London. And this was a kind of uh, a humanitarian way in which to imprison people. Because before this, the idea was that if someone was imprisoned, then you sort of put them in a dungeon, throw the key away, and forgot about them. So, um, there were certain social reformers who came in and said, we'll create a prison where people can be rehabilitated. In other words, they go to the prison, they serve their sentence, but then they come out, they come out as hopefully reformed people. Okay? And the idea of a panopticon was that you had a prison which was in full view of everyone else. So you had a central tower, and then you had all your cells around you, so that the wardens can observe the prisoners, and the prisoners can observe the wardens, and anyone else who's there could see what was happening. So in a sense, environmental sensing, which is done traditionally, is based on this principle. That is, you have a sensor in a city, and that sensor senses the environment, and then you kind of try and see what is the local exposure based on the reading at this, at, at this sensor. So, so, for instance, um, in the case of wildlife monitoring, traditionally the way it's done is you tag your wild animals and then you go around, so he's the panopticon with his antenna, and then you see, you know, what is the location, is the animal still there, and things of that sort. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. And in the case of environmental sensing, what you have is a sensing station, okay, something like this. And this is the one which is in Edinburgh, in Scotland, and that serves the entire city of a population of 600,000. So it's, it's about, uh, I don't know, 150 square miles, or maybe less than that, square kilometers, right? And for this entire place, you have one sensing station. So if you are 20 miles away, or, or if you are five miles away, you are basing your exposure on what is sensed in this particular sensing station, okay? Which is not a, which is not a very good state of affairs if you are concerned as to how much particulates that you're inhaling, how much of the nitrogen dioxide that you're inhaling, or any other gases that you're inhaling, okay? So, and what they do is you have uh, models based on computational fluid dynamics. And what these models do is that you first come up with a, a 3D geometry of the physical buildings in the, in the area, and then you, you simulate the wind field through these uh, physical structures. For instance, you have tunnel effects where you have high buildings on either sides, for instance. And then you see how the pollutants are actually dispersed through these three models. So you can imagine that this is extremely computationally intensive and only very few people who have the know-how and the knowledge can actually get this information. And the other very important thing that you find is that, like the panopticon, you have a central source who actually controls the information. And that is very important because Information is controlled by the people who can afford a station, right? An air monitoring station, which costs about 500,000 euros, okay? That's the cost of these stations. They're very expensive. They're around 400,000 euros. You need regular calibration of these things, okay? The absolute measurements is very accurate. And the reason why you want to do that is because there are some quite strict EU regulations which are in place. And cities and countries are required to conform to these regulations. So, um, so these, the accurate absolute measurements is used to determine conformance with EU pollution limits. But here is an example of how you create a law so that you can 
limit the pollution. But really, it's not much use to the citizens themselves. You know, because the citizens don't have any information about what the pollution is, where they live, where they work, where they travel. Okay, where they go by bicycle or where they go in the car or whatever. So, and you can see this already. You know, this is an article I got from the Guardian newspaper, where these air pollution monitoring stations face closure as government looks at cut in order to cut costs. And it is estimated the one type of pollution is killing 29,000 people a year in the UK and costing health services around 16 billion. So, you have this an issue, a silent killer which is around you, okay, which uh, people don't realize what is happening because they don't have access to the information. This information is very controlled in this case as to what the pollution level is. And it really doesn't matter where it's measured because it's measured centrally and you don't know what your personal exposure is. So that is the problem, that is the issue that can we sort of try and address this using um, using sensors and using crowdsourcing information. So there's a problem which is not only technically very interesting, but also socially, politically, it's got lots of ramifications because this actually informs the way um, we allow, say, planning permissions to be made as to whether to allow new roads to be built or whether to increase the traffic or to actually manage the traffic better, etc. Okay, so, so this has ramifications beyond just the technical issues. So, what we'd like to do is the following. Can we use sensors to measure personal exposure where it matters? Remember the computational fluid dynamics models. You know, do you need something as complex as that? So what you're doing is, previously, or currently, you're measuring at a place very accurately, albeit, and then you have models as to how it disperses. And then depending on where your location is, you are kind of like, get a count for the exposure. So can we measure personal exposure where it matters? And can we crowd sense or source the environmental data? Um, can it be inexpensive and easy to operate? Because that's important, because you're going to get not just computer scientists with PhD operating this, but anyone should be able to use this to be as easy as using a mobile phone, in other words. And um, there, is this, there is this kind of uh, trade-off that you're making. In one case, you have highly accurate sensors, but they are rooted physically to one location, right? So that is on one hand, that's how it's normally used now. And on the other hand, what you have is uh, my sensor is inexpensive, it's not going to be as accurate as, your, uh, as, the, um, as the expensive one. But having numerous values from these sensors could help you in getting as spatial resolution as possible before. And you can get a better trend because you have more data points here. So rather than thinking in terms of absolute values, should we be looking at the trends in value and whether this could be useful in kind of inferring certain conditions, setting information. Okay. And also, very importantly, you are engaging the citizens. And that is very important because people talk in terms of citizen science and all that. Here is a very good example of how citizens can be engaged to get involved, to actually be both the consumer of the data and the producer of the data. So, so you get an engaged citizenship who are better informed as well. Okay, so let, let me sort of um, try and identify certain categories of, uh, of um, spaces that we are really concerned about. Because in a sense, what we're trying to do is map the social and public space that we have around you based on some measurements which are made in the personal space of the people. So that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to map the space which is kind of in a radius of something like 25 feet and above based on the measurements that you make um, in this kind of diameter around the person because that's where the sensors are sensitive to. But the important thing is that you get numerous readings 
and the person wearing the sensor, sensor is not necessarily static. They move around in this, in this space. So you, if you were to take, say, sensing every second, for instance, and a person who is walking moves around at about four miles per hour, you know, that's the normal speed, you're getting quite a dense uh, resolution spatially in terms of what you're getting, uh, in terms of the data. So, so that's what we mean by sensing uh, the public space based on personal readings. Okay. So what, I'm going to, what I was going to do next is give you some background on spec, SpecNet and spectral computing and then look at more detail at each of the two projects, okay, the my, my Q and the horse sense, and then based on the conclusions. So, um, so in 2002, this was the aim, and these the next two slides haven't changed. You know, they came from the original proposal. And the idea here was to endow person and object with sensing, processing, wireless networking capabilities. You're linking the physical world of sensory data to the virtual world of digital information. But the physical world is a primary site of interaction. Okay? So you're aiming to bridge the physical and virtual worlds. And the reason why it was exciting to do that in 2002 was because there was discussions then on the new extension to IPv4. The new Internet Protocol version 6 was under discussion. Okay, so, um, and we knew then that your namespace was going to increase, so um, to 128 bits, and you could have uh, 39 trillion separate subnetworks, and each subnetwork in turn could connect millions of devices. So, effectively, you could have unique IP addresses for all these devices, almost as if every grain of sand, you can have a unique name to it. So that was incredibly powerful. And in other words, you could have a connected world between people and smart objects. And what smart meant here in this case was somehow you're context sensitive, that is, you are sensing something about the context in which you are operating. And one of the very important contexts is location, so you're location aware. Okay. So that was the reason behind that. And the idea here is of spectral computing is that you sense. You process the data that you send, so in this case it's a raw sensor data, and then you do something like a PCA or something of that sort, and you're getting some information out of this. You communicate with other such sensors to extract some intelligence in inverted commas, and you act on that. So you sense, you learn, and you act. And the time constant could be anywhere between a few milliseconds to a few hours, depends on the kind of application that you have, and it could either be completely autonomous, or you can have a human in the loop, depending on the kind of applications. But that's the, um, that's the kind of philosophy behind uh, spectral computing as it was set out uh, early on. And over the years, we have built a number of platforms, and there's a platform which is like a, a moat which came out in 2002, and that is one which has an ARM processor, and as the first device which actually had a JBM, the Squawk JBM, which was done in collaboration with Sun Labs, which then became the Sunspot device. And if you, some of you might have worked with that in the past. Um, so that's what that was. And then these are miniaturization of these uh, devices. This one has the same uh, memory and processing power as that. It has an 8-bit micro. There's an 8-bit micro in those days. And it has 16 bytes, uh, 16k bytes of RAM, uh, sorry, 8, 8k bytes of RAM and 16k of flash. So what you had is platforms which were not your current platforms, but they had extremely limited resources, and you had to learn to program them, you had to learn to use the, uh, the memory in a very kind of uh, uh, restricted fashion. So that's what you have. And these are two specialist uh, platforms, one which is called Orient, and this one has the capability uh, to do 3D motion capture for you in real time. So it's a wireless motion capture. You could wear this, and then you could capture your motion in three-dimensional space. And here's an example of that, I believe, if this comes on. You can see an example of uh, the person moving around, and in real time, you're capturing the human motion. Um, and this was done in 2006 time frame. So this is the first time you could do 
motion capture. And this found its application in lots of, uh, I'm going to skip this, in lots of different areas such as animation. You could do animation in real time uh, sitting on your, sitting in your desk, but previously you needed to have a, um, you needed to have a mocap studio. This is even before you had Kinect and things of that sort which came along. And unlike Kinect, you're not restricted in your range, you can do this anywhere, you don't have to stand in front of the camera. So this is an example of uh, the Internet of Things in its early days, and this is one example of a character, you know, and you can see that uh, because of the difference in the lengths of their legs, they have to exaggerate the walk, yeah? And then you can combine these two, and this could be done in about two hours. And that was the advantage of doing that, you combine the two, you had a small storyline, and there's an idea of you can actually use sensors in order to capture the human motion and then um, give attributes of this motion to, to characters, okay? Um, or, in this case, you could uh, do music from motion. Um, if I could just do that because my... There should be sound in this one. So this is yet another example of, oh, sorry, is an example of your sensing data, you're processing the data, and then you are networking with other such sensors, and then you're actuating, that is, you are, in this case, producing the sound. And what's happening here, oops, it's not, one second, if I could just run this again. Hopefully that should be okay. And what you're doing here is, in real time, you are capturing the motion, and you're mapping the motion to sounds. In this case, the kind of um, music which accompanies a flamenco dancer. In other words, the dancer is producing music, and she's dancing um, in turn. So, so what I'm really trying to do here is the real time nature. Now this is very different from the other examples that I'm going to show you using the Internet of Things um, in environment sensing because you don't need that immediate feedback. It's okay if you get it within a few minutes or a few hours. But here's an example where you're actuating, where you're turning a robot. So this is done in 2007 time frame. Okay. So um, what I'm trying to get across is this that. Uh, it's not just sensing, but what you sense leads to actions. And those actions are informed by the information that you extract from the sensory data. Okay, so, so we'll leave that. And um, so there are other applications, such as medical applications. I'm going to skip all that and then show you my cue come from, because we're coming to the environmental sensing now. Okay, so remember the, the, the underlying concept here. The underlying concept is, based on numerous personal observations, sensory observations, sensory data, you're trying to map the social and public spaces. So that's what you're trying to do. And one of the first projects that we worked on is to see whether we could put sensors on buses. Okay? Put sensors on buses. And buses are, are useful because they have limited, they have very fixed routes. Okay? So the trade-off was, can we have numerous sensors along the bus route? That's one way of doing it. Right? 
So the number of sensors you need is, um, depending on the resolution that you have, if you say once every lamppost or once every uh, 200 meters, you know, depending on the length of the bus route, there's going to be a, a number of sensors that you need. So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to say, okay, I'll put them on top of buses and I'll let the buses run up and down and see what is it that you can sense. So, and what we sensed here was things like PM10. So these are particle matter with a mass of, t uh, particle matter with a diameter of 10 microns, or you have nanoparticles, or you can have black carbon. Black carbon is what comes in the exhaust of your, uh, of your automobiles, you know, that comes out, especially in diesel automobiles. And you can get the data, and for the first time you're able to view this data in a fashion where you get spatial temporal data. So you can have Google Map and you can map it on that, or you can sort of look at it as a graph over time. So these are the values. And you can see a big spike here. And the big spike there, it could be explained because there was a building work which is taking place there. And um, so there's a lot of dust which has been blown up. And as the bus went past it, you're picking up this data. So here's an example where you can validate this data against that. Okay, so this is real pollution data. How accurate is the data also? Did you calibrate the sensors in any way? Uh, okay, so these sensors are actually commercial sensors. They're quite large, as you can see. These are not personal sensors that you wear. So these are commercial sensors which comes from a company who in turn calibrate it. And they are well housed in temperature controlled environments. Okay, so this is a company called EnviroLogger, which actually produced these sensors. Um, so in a sense, we didn't have to calibrate. We kind of got straight from there and we sort of... But the calibration is an important issue. I'll come, come back to that later. And, um, and what is useful about this, and I think there's a point made earlier, is that you can get sensors from different sources. But the important thing is that they need to be synchronized. So I could have a sensor which measures my breathing rate, and I want to see how my breathing rate changes with the particulates in the environment. Okay? And the reason why that is important is that I want to see what the effect of increase in particulates in the environment is on my, uh, on my respiratory condition. So fortunately, what happens is that many of these sensors, we can actually have a <coughs> synchronization algorithm because they operate the same radio, the same protocol, and then you have a time synchronized um, network there, and you're getting data from your sensors, and you're also getting data from these uh, uh, monitors on this person, and they can mash them together and see are there any are there any causal effects and you're allowed to do that because you can line them on the time domain okay so so those were sensors and buses so you're, you're kind of taking little steps as it were in this uh, crowdsourcing experiment because it's not just one bus you can put them on several buses and then you're crowdsourcing you kind of bus sourcing data, you know, all these buses going around, you have a fleet of these buses, and you're getting data from all these buses, and you can match, you can combine them, and you get a picture of a city-wide um, picture of the environmental conditions. And if you're in that area, then you can actually look at what is the condition of that area at that time. You can see the trends, and you can see how much you're exposed to. But it's still not as as accurate as we want it to be in terms of, or as space resolved as you want it to be. Okay. So the second one we tried was a personal exposure monitor. This is version one. And as you can see, it's quite long. You know, it's, it's kind of in a perspex tube. You have a fan at one end, and then you get air which is sucked in, and then you have the various sensors in this. In this case, it has a a particulate sensor, and then it has a carbon monoxide sen sensor and temperature and humidity. So this was a student project that we worked on over six weeks last year, towards the end of last year. And we learned a lot by doing that, because what this does is talks 
Bluetooth low energy to a mobile phone. So in other words, you could be carrying this in a haversack or something like that in the side pouch with a mobile phone. It kind of, the mobile phone records the data, time stamps it, location stamps it, and then you can download the data to your, uh, to your PC and upload the data to the website. So in other words, what you have is a, an end-to-end where you are sensing data and you are uh, you're kind of providing meta information in the data and then sharing the data um, over the web. Okay. And um, so these are sort of, there's an example of going out over a period of time where you are, and that's on 25th of November at 2.05. So what's happening here is the temperature. So in this case, uh, I was inside the building, I came out of the building and went to a kind of a, a park which is just outside and then I came back here and I see that the temperature goes down. It is November after all, so you'd expect it to be around uh, between 5 and 10 degrees, that's what it was. And also the humidity, the humidity was low inside the building, as it went out it was kind of raining a bit, the humidity has gone up. Yes? You can see like you've quite a few data points that clustered. Right, so screen, nothing. Yes. How come? Do you have to log manually? Then? No, 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 it wasn't logging manually. Um, I think this was a case where, uh, as I said, it was the early days and they were kind of getting data. It wasn't getting, um, they weren't getting good connections all the time. You know. that, was what, that was what is happening here. Yes, but it, that, that improves uh, in the second version. And this is what you have get data for carbon monoxide. And you can see that there are some points. This is a traffic light. Um, there's a kind of a crossroad where four roads meet, and there is a high instance of carbon monoxide. And this is the middle of the garden, the park. The carbon monoxide level is low. So it all kind of makes sense. You know, th these are the, the first one. So that was in December of 2013. And then we moved to the same that one you have has been reduced to this size now. Okay, the long tube has now been reduced with good engineering and new components and things of that sort. So what you have is that, and uh, that talks Bluetooth LE to a, an iPad. So the person carries the iPad and you can see the data on the iPad. And also the iPad is able to upload the data to a, to a website. And what this is, is a personal exposure monitor which is, weird, which is worn on the upper arm like this. And it has an optical dust sensor from Sharp. It has an NO203. And this particular one, um, yeah, it has an NO203. And then you have temperature, humidity, Bluetooth, 32 bit ARM processor. And you're getting GPS and time for the sensor reading once per second, which is quite a high resolution when you think about it. And um, if you're getting this kind of data from other sources, um, you're getting quite a dense picture about what's happening. Because the secret here is that you need lots of volunteers to actually uh, uh, sort of, uh, adopt this and upload the data. So you're relying on volunteers. And that's something that we'll address later for any crowdsourcing project. OK. Can you so, just uh, sure. comment a little bit more? I think it's quite critical for, um, for the whole business, like how you design the casing, actually, in case the census, right? Yes. In a way of, you know, that, uh, you know, yes. how, how the air enters and then you pick up basically the path. Yes. So I'll, 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 I'll tell you something more about that. Um, and I make a final conclusion is that computer scientists are not good designers. So, um, so take this uh, with uh, the thing. So, um, so what you have is, a, in this case, you have a micro pump. So, which is on. on uh, sorry, you have a fan, which is on this side. The previous one had a microphone. This has a fan. And effectively, um, you have a hole, an inlet here. And this is the particulate sensor. All right? So it goes to the hole. And this is based on an LED, which is doing a particulate count. So it's not as, it is inexpensive. It costs only about four pounds. OK? Um, but, and I'll show you the data comparing this with something which costs hundred times that, was 400 pounds. Okay. Um, you get the data coming in, um, 
you get a particulate and then it flows over this and you have a temperature humidity next to that and it kind of flows out. There are a number of flaws with this first design. And one of the flaws is this, that what you really want to do is have a tunnel where you have all the sensors, which is insulated from the electronics. Because over time, you'll find that the lifetime of the electronics goes down because you're exposing it to all lots of damp air which is sort of coming through. Okay, so um, the next design actually improves on that in the sense that you have the sensors and the next design has an array of sensors because you have, this one only has carbon monoxide on this. The next one, although I do say that it has NO2 or 3, that the next design is NO2 or 3. But the problem with the NO2 or 3 is that you can have um, sort of um, interference because when you're measuring NO2, you're also measuring O3. So you need a separate O3 sensor to subtract the O3 level to give you the true NO2 level. Okay, yeah, that's what. Channels, that's Sorry? We need three channels. You need three channels, but then that is expensive. You need to keep it small. So the idea here is that you have one channel, but that is insulated from the electronics, which is around it. So, so you have two concentric tubes, what do you call it that? Um, or in this case, you have a, a separate channel here where this goes through. So that is, that is important, and you really need uh, experienced people to do that for you. And this first example was done by ourselves, and one of the conclusions we reached is, we are not experts in this, we really need uh, designers to get involved. You know, that's another conclusion in there. Yes. When you find the housing is such that it's, it's black, but you're right, you need to see it black. But we didn't have that much of an issue in ambient light. It's only when you have uh, sort of... Okay, the interior especially, when you have lots of light, that's an issue. And this is mainly aimed at uh, people in the outside, so that wasn't an issue. But you're right. That's No signal. Okay. So that was the personal. And we also have in the same family a mobile exposure monitor. And what this is, is a far more sophisticated uh, uh, particle counter. So unlike the sharp one, which just measures particles about 10 microns. No, they have to be quite large. Um, this particular one um, gives you a spectrum of particle sizes, ranging from 1 micron to 15 microns. And it puts it into 16 bins for you. Okay? So you have 16 bins, and these are the sizes of the various bins. So you have intervals here of the size of different bins. And what you have is a very, it's a wonderful piece of sensor, you know, which is just coming out, you know, we, we just got an, an advance. There, there were only about 20 which were sent out, and we were number six and seven, we've got two of these. And what this is, is you're getting a spectrum of the different sizes, and what you can do is you can actually train a network in order to see what different combinations of sizes you get for different activities. For instance, if you're cooking um, and you're boiling water or you are frying something, you have different you have different spectrums in the signals. So you can train a network to actually um, uh, distinguish various activities based on the particulates which are coming out of that. Okay. So, for instance, you can detect pollen areas where there is a higher pollen count, for instance, and it's smaller. Uh, smaller particles, which is very dangerous for people with respiratory disease and big spots on. So you're able to, so pollen is people who suffer from hay fever, you know, they're concerned about that. So having this spectrum of different sizes is, is, has potential well beyond what we're doing at the moment, and we are exploring this as we speak, okay? So the difference between the two sensors that you saw before and this one is that, is in the type of, uh, 
particulate counter that you have. But the difference is also in the price, because this one comes at a cost. This costs 100 times more than the previous one. But the challenge is, you know, can we use the inexpensive sensor against the more expensive one and calibrate the inexpensive sensor using some kind of a mapping between the two? Okay? And if you can do that, then that's useful. So that's what we're going to talk about next, is how we can, we can do this. So, so what you're doing here is, you know, people talk in terms of hyperlocality as being the new frontier of the social media. You know, in the case of social media, you're getting data, which is, uh, which is you put in in some way, but can you get sensor data to be sourced into the social media? So that's what is happening here. So. You characterize the quality of environment in a locality based on numerous personal sense and contribution. In this case, personal is what affects me, uh, my well-being in this case. So that's what is defined as personal for us. And here are some examples where you can have an app running on your iPad, and you can see the locations, and you can also have a graph of the data, etc. So you can do all these wonderful things. Um, okay. So, an obvious thing to do is carry both these sensors. So what you want to do is to try and use the inexpensive sensor, but at the same time try and improve the quality of those inexpensive sensors. And you can only do that because you have a more expensive <laughs> sensor which is mobile. Okay, quite obviously you can't carry around the uh, $400,000 uh, sensor station. And here's an example. Um, this is a logarithmic scale, and what you see on the blue is with the expensive sensor from AlphaSense, and what you see in the red is the inexpensive sensor from Sharp. Okay? And even just by looking at this, you can see that there is some kind of correlation between the two. Yeah? And you can see that it goes up, it goes up. But obviously, uh, the absolute values are not the same. We don't expect it to. But remember what I said previously. Can we sort of bring up trends in the values? Maybe that is interesting. That's what we can do. That's not being explored as much in this context as absolute values. Because people have been, uh, got their brains figured on what is the value that I need to report to the EU Commission rather than how useful is this for people or citizens. And that's what you're trying to do here. And um, so here's an example of uh, a walk around this park I told you about, which is just behind our building. And uh, on top you have data from the um, from the Alpha Sense, the expensive one, and this is from the the sharp one. Okay, and you can see a heat map of that route. And what this heat map gives you is uh, it's not identical. We don't expect it to be, but it's similar. Okay. So what we can then do is to run statistical analysis on this, and and this is a kind of temporal variation. To go the same route on different days. Okay. Then you can see variation. Then you try and have cause and effect as to what might have caused that variation in there, and then you can start mapping these things. Because the other sensor that you have, you can, you can, they put them in different bins. You can see which bins reflect the, uh, the particle which is sensed by the inexpensive one, by the sharp one. So on top you have the PM10, uh, middle one you have 2.5, and the bottom one you have PM1. And it turns out the PM10 is the one that it's more likely to be sensing the sharp one. So that's the one that you want to calibrate that against. And this is a mapping table that we came up with. There's a lot of uh, processing in between and things of that sort. And this is a mapping table. Um, you get uh, um, alpha sense values. It's microgram per uh, meter cube. Per, per liter, sorry, per meter cube. Per liter. Uh, that's what you have alpha sense. And the PM value is actually a voltage that you get out of it. And you have a mapping between the two. And this is. Okay, um, yeah, there's more. 30 volts. <laughs> well, it's not 30 volts. It's, it's a value. Okay. It's micro. It's 
And they are very uptight about science. There are other people who are modelers. What they do is they get a sort of data from sensors, and then they're modeling the dispersion, how it affects the community, and things like so that. Okay. For them, having more data points is better than having none at all. Okay. So because at the moment they have one sensor here, they might have another static sensor somewhere else, and in, in between, they have yes. Finger off of the air and say, we believe the diffusion is this, and um, there's really nothing to actually support that. And they are very interested. You know, one of the part of the Center for Ecology and Hydrology did, did a lot of more things. So the city council, and this is something I bring up later, the city council, who are, who are the statutory body which has to report back to Brussels, they are very independent. So, don't they don't want to know. Well, well, we had a, the project uh, back in 2010, I think we did the deployment of uh, environment monitoring or air quality monitoring devices on the buses. Yes. And uh, we did it in a city which is uh, notoriously known for being polluted, yes. at least in Serbia. And uh, the actual initiative came from the council also, from the mayor of the city. And yes. the reason being they wanted to show that uh, it's not that bad as uh, yes. the perception, perception is, yes. and to show to attract investors because they lost uh, one investor or two investors yes. because they thought the air pollution is high. And yes. this was the way to show that, okay, it's not that high. Yes. Um, it might be right. You know, um, you're right. I mean, we, we are able to do this in cooperation with the bus company and the city council, but the, the different parts of the city council. So the city council is responsible for environmental monitoring. I have to report back to Brussels. They are less happy about this. Yeah. Okay, the other parts of the city council, like the mayor, who wants to get involved in investment, he's keen to demonstrate something. So that's the other thing, you know, how you use the data. You know, it's, uh, it can be cut in different ways. And that's why it's a very tricky uh, situation that you need to be aware of. Yep. Okay, so um, that's about environmental monitoring um, um, in the uh, MyQ project. So I'm going to go and talk about the POS project here, POS sets. Um, the idea here is that uh, you have sensors on the horses. And, um, so this is uh, Spain, and that's Seville. And this Doniana National Park is here, west of... Uh, Civil, right? And this is a map of the area. There is a sea on one side, and there are kind of rivers which flow through that. And seasonally, it's very different. The variation, the temperature is very large. Uh, it becomes very marshy in the rainy season, for instance. And the places where the horses spend time changes accordingly, right? So, and these are the horses which are tagged with our sensors. You can see them with a yellow tag. So uh, in September of last year, what happened was all the, uh, about 33 horses were corralled. So you get all the horses, put these sensors on them, and then let them loose. OK, that's the idea. So this is the period when they were corralled. They were put them in the fence, in a penned area, and you put the sensors on them. And this is what the sensors looked like. These were developed in our labs. And um, we'll see about them a bit later. So the aim here was to monitor the relationship between the horses and the environment. That's what you're trying to do, understand better. And um, there is monitoring the large. That is, you're trying to understand the, the uh, ensemble behavior of the horses. What you have is a group, and you want to see what is the group behavior of the horses. And the reason you want to understand the group behavior is that um, you want to understand which horses spend time with which other horses, which could lead to things like uh, spread of disease, for instance. Okay? And you're also monitoring the small. You want to understand the behavior of individual horses. And why do you want to do that? The reason you want to do that is so that you can um, find out 
how does it inform the conservation of the ecology of the, of the park? Um, such as where do the horses spend time in the reserve? And um, you want to have, ask questions of the conservation of the species. What is the social behavior? What is the epidemiology? Which horses spend time together and for how long? And these Ruteta horses have a, have a behavior where they go in herds. These are sort of herd mentality. But usually you have one male with several females. It's like a harem concept. You know. They move around in that fashion. And um, you want to look at the activity and feeding patterns of the individual horses. Okay? So it's quite challenging because, as I said, it's over a period where the environment changes over the 12 months. So you needed a platform to run for this period of time. Um, and, and because these are protected horses, people are very concerned about their safety, about their comfort, etc. So it had to be something that would lightweight, as light as possible. So it, the weight of this was 165 grams, which has the weight of the enclosure, the circuit board, and the battery. At the same time, it had a collar, and the collar was weighted in such a way that um, the sensor would be on the top so that it could get the GPS location and the, uh, principally the GPS location and communicate wirelessly to base stations. Now, here's an example where you can't have a horse with a, an iPhone or an iPad or anything of that sort. So it had to be integrated. The GPS location had to be integrated with the, the rest of the sensor which causes no end of problems, because as you probably know, GPS is very energy hungry. So you needed to come up with ways in which to run this in an efficient way. So again, in projects such as these, it's a compromise. It's a compromise between what the biologists wanted. If you ask the biologists, they'll say, give me all the data. Give me as frequent as you can. But that's not possible. Right? So it's a negotiation that you have in such a way to make what is feasible against what is useful. Okay, if you say I'm only going to give you once every 24 hours, that's not much of use to the biologists. Okay. So we, so here is a compromise, and we came up that we'll give them three times per hour. Every 20 minutes, we'll give you a, a GPS reading and also the sensor reading in the in the previous 20 minutes. Uh, a summary of that in some way. I'll come to that. And then they need to operate, operate in very harsh conditions. Okay. They have to be dust proof, they have to be waterproof, they have to be shock proof. So uh, did you there's a lot of work which went into that. Did you do log it locally or did you actually do live, live updates? Um, you try and live updates it, but you don't log it. They log it in the RAM, you can also write it into a flash. Yeah, but I guess log, logging. Logging would be reduced, uh, you know, if you have not no real time requirements. Well, the, the, no, the point is that people wanted it not in real time, but uh, up, up, uploaded as it's being logged. Uh, whenever the boss is close to a base station, they wanted to be logged. Okay, so it could be like a week between the days and the days. In fact, there were some weeks between the <laughs> Yes, you're right. Um, so this is a kind of block diagram of this. I won't dwell on this too, too much. Um, it has a GPS module, it has an accelerometer, a magnetometer. It has an 8 megabyte flash, it has a solar charger, um, it has an antenna connector as well. Um, so we use the EFM32 microcontroller, uh, 128 kilobytes of RAM, 1 megabyte of ROM, and that's the radio, 2.4 gigahertz radio. Um, we had some solar charging circuit as well, a dual battery interface. Um, and we had custom designed this trap, so we got a terrier people who, who produced saddles for horses and actually produced these, uh, um, these collars for us. So these were all custom designed, plus the original hand drawn design, and this is what it looks like. And they are weighted with uh, lead pellets so that they will always, um, the antenna will always come up. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the actual sensor would be right on top. And um, so this is the, the battery that we have, a lithium-final chloride battery. 
Um, 3.6 volts, the two of them giving you 500 milliampere hours, 5,000 milliampere hours. On top of that, you have also solar charging percentage. Longer antenna. So the, longer range, uh, yes, yes, it's a longer antenna as well. The antenna is the biggest problem then, because the antenna gets broken. In fact, we went down in frequency to 868 megahertz. The antenna is a quick antenna. But we found the problem was that it actually is very difficult to keep in place. For a no, not, not 500 meters, 1,000 meters. You can actually get 500 meters with this because we put up the base station right on top of the tower. Um, and that's one of the experiments we did before we settled on frequency, is although we find the frequency, at the end of the day, there are other considerations such as the, 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 the antenna shrinking on Okay, they were potted with the re enterable silicon compound providing vibration protection and waterproofing for IP68 standards. So these are the kinds of. So this is deploying sensors in the wild, you know. They don't get any more difficult than this. And this is the process which kind of takes you through what happens. And here's an example of all these traps being ready for deployment on the horses before they are corralled. And um, here's one of the base stations that you can see, which was conveniently for us, there was a tower dotted in the, in the park. So that's what it looks like. And here's some examples of uh, GPS readings uh, for a horse over a 24-hour period. So it tells you where the horse is, things like that. And there are some sensor readings to get one sense. And um, so this is in the Doniana, you can actually see the map. And uh, this is all the DPS readings for the first two months. So I'm showing you data for the first two months. Because we still haven't analyzed the full 12 months, we just came with data in as we speak. And uh, what I'm going to show you is how we track the group behavior of the horses. So what you have here is is a snapshot in the first hour of deployment. Okay? So remember, the horses are all corralled, they come in, we put the sensors, and we let them loose, and they glad to be wild again. Okay, so they're running away. We give them some time to set it. And they form these groups already. Okay. And um, so these are the groups in the first hour. Because it's the first hour you get three readings, you know. So you see not just three readings, but multiple readings in that hour, because they are readings every 20 minutes, as you know. Okay? So you have group one, and those are the horses, those are the numbers of the horses. Group two, group three, group four, and group five. So this is what happened in the first hour. And from the first hour onwards, we track the horses. Okay? From the first hour onwards, we track the horses for 12 months. We get sort of reams and reams of data that we are mining in you know, order to get information from this. And, um, and you can get information such as uh, the group one size. How does it change over time? So you have a core group, but then you have other horses joining in for short periods and then leaving. Right? So it's a dynamic group. Never made sign. There are lone horses, for instance. And you see that here. So, percentage of time when a horse is part of a group, you can see that some of the horses, like 18 and 19, are loners. You know, they're not part of groups, they're kind of roaming around. They could be stray male horses, you know, which go around joining another one, get beaten back, and then join another one, and they stay on their own. Okay? <clears throat> Whereas female horses tend to be a bit more. Kind of, they tend to remain in the group for a few of time. So that's what you have, the person at a time when a group, and a horse is part of a group. And um, instance of group sizes. And that is interesting, because you, what you're finding here is, what are the sizes of the groups for a period of time? And then you find the size of group, group seven, 
is second only to, to having two horses within a certain range. That is part, part of the group, so you determine the ranges. And then you look at the hourly activity for all the horses over a two-month period. So as you, as you can expect, the midnight, in the early hours, there's less activity. They're kind of standing still, sleeping. Horses stand when they sleep. <coughs> um, so they're in a kind of state where they're standing. There's less activity, and that goes up through the day. So that's the diurnal activity of the horses. And then you can see the average time that the heads are down you find that in the night the head is down and you'd expect that because they sleep with the head down. We try to differentiate between eating and then having the head down. We find a different way to differentiate too. We could have designed this slightly better. But this kind of thing that you learn after the first deployment. And here is the group dynamics of the horses, of group one. And that's a complicated diagram there. So what you're doing here is you are following group one and all the horses in group one over a period of time, for two months. And you can see that you have stable membership of this group. So these are the horses, these were the original group members. And they are stable here. But you have other horses joining in and some of the stable members go out very temporarily and then come back. Yes? So, uh, I'm sorry, I just didn't talk for a moment. So right. Maybe I answered another question. Uh, and how do you measure the horse-to-horse -horse contact? Um, we're using the GPS. Yes. So this is GPS. Yes. Just co-location. Co-location to GPS, and you set a limit, and uh, um, fifty meters. Fifty meters. Given the size of the park, it's within sixty meters. But, but you were not interested in kind of just two CTRs. I mean, but still, I mean, say in terms of. I know. Um, we we can do an RSSI because we have all these contacts about this. But um, if you have GPS, use it. And we can, we can sort of confirm against yeah. RSSI, so I have the services, but it's notoriously yeah. so, yeah. inaccurate. Yeah. Nobody seriously uses RSSI. So, so, so this is a kind of complicated diagram, but uh, what it gives you is the group dynamics over time um, and which were the stable members of the group and which were the other horses to join the group and left the group. And this is gold mine for the biologists. For the first time, they're looking at the dynamic behavior of these horses, which they could only do using binoculars for a short period of time. Right? Now you have this, uh, a group of 25 horses with wealth of information about these horses over a 12 month period. Okay, so it's a collaborative effort with conservationists, ecologists, and animal ecologists. Ecology is the study of animal behavior. Um, and they interpreted a 12 months worth of census data for December 2014. Um, and then in the future. So, one of the things we can do is I, I didn't show you about the breeding monitor, but we can actually monitor the breeding of horses as well, the risk of the breeding rate. Um, using these sensors, and you know, that's what they look like. Um, okay. Um, I'm reaching the conclusion. So, um, we're getting novel insights into the behavior in the case of horse sense, which wasn't possible otherwise. So, it's a fantastic example of crowdsourcing data for horses in order to look after their welfare, right? And um, given that these are protected species, any information that you can get without being too intrusive is useful for their well-being and longevity, right? And um, and in the case of the other project, the the MyQ project, I think the the principal thing which comes out of this is that uh, the content creators are not just passive consumers. So you get people who are both consumers of data as well as creators of the data. Um, but the question really you have to ask is why do people want to do it? Is this pure altruism? Or is you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart? Or is there self-interest? 
And sometimes they're just selfish in the case of environmental monitoring because either you or your loved ones or your friend or someone is suffering from some kind of ailment where knowing the, um, the kind of quality of the environment in the immediate area would make a difference to your life. Okay? So in some cases it's self-interest as well. And then there are tensions. And this is what we kind of learned um, in our work because um, traditionally such information is only available to the city council because they are the owners of these expensive uh, air stations. And they are very nervous about anyone who comes in with other interpretation of the data. Okay? So previously you had only one source of information, whereas there is now competing sources of information. And the first thing that they say is, your data is not accurate, which is correct. Yes, your data is not accurate. But then, their data is not it's very accurate for the application, but it says nothing about exposure to the people. Okay, so it's getting the people involved in this um, is, is important. Um, and then there are certain pressure groups, such as Friends of the Earth, you know, who are very keen to get this kind of information. And but then, how do they use the information so that they don't use it as a stick to beat up the council? So. So what I'm trying to bring across is that uh, data can be very explosive, you know. It has political ramifications. Information that you extract from that has all kinds of issues for society. So as computer scientists, you have to be careful. As engineers, you have to be careful as to how you use the data. The issues as provenance, and those brought out previously, is, you know, what faith do you have in that data which is coming? Is it an outline? Has that traditionally been something wrong with it? When was it last calibrated? So all these kinds of information is very important. The quality, accuracy, issues of privacy and security. Given that you're getting GPS application here, you have to be very careful as to how you, you broadcast that information to the public because you might be giving away personal information and people will be terribly happy with you you to do that. Um, future work, we are looking at extending horse sense to other wild animals and birds with adaptations. And we are working with a number of agencies to take the MyQ project forward for a large scale, involving school children, citizens, and certain, certain uh, environmental groups, etc. So, here's a summary of my, some high level lessons that we learned. You don't need to have put horses, sensors of horses to get this insight. But anyway, I'll reinforce that. Where possible, use off-the-shelf components. Um, the entire uh, horse sense project was custom designed, and um, including the GPS, which proved to be quite a difficult issue. Um, whereas in the other project, um, that needed to be that way. Whereas in the other project, we get all the, the MyQ project, we get all the GPS information from a off-the-shelf smartphone and things of that sort. And we didn't even think about putting GPS in those. So where possible, we use off-the-shelf components. Um, variable devices, um, it's very important, especially in crowd sets, that they don't wear it for a day and then forget about it, or wear it for two days. And the reasons they don't use it is because it's uncomfortable, or because it's difficult to use. So you have to give a lot of thought into the variability issues of that and also into the ease of use. And um, ah, I had a I had a line there which said uh, computer science yeah. Computer scientists are not good designers. We think that we know how to design, but that's an entirely different discipline. Okay? And I have worked with designers, so I mean, this is a, a year-long project that I did with 24 designers, which resulted in an in an exhibition with some wonderful creative stuff, which sent me out of it. Um, but you need to have a feel for the person and how the person would use it. That's not something we are often trained to do. So where possible, either get new scientists who are sensitive to that, 
of game designers who are sensitive to computer science. There are very few of them. Okay. So, and very important how do you represent the information when a key message leaks out. You don't want people to drown the data. You want to, the key piece of information should jump out at you. So there's a lot of ACR data, visualization data work that you need to concentrate on. It should be easy to personalize. There are different people who like to use it in, in different ways. So uh, you need to have, you know, there's not one solution that fits all. So you need to be able to personalize. And finally, you know, are people simply concerned about the environment to pay for it? I mean, there is a panel of business trap in this, but you should also get your minds thinking about this. You know, I'm getting all this data wonderful, but you need to sustain it for a period of time. How will you do it? Who do you need to pay for this data, this information? Or it could be a barter system where every consumer is also a producer. So it's an exchange. You know, I produce data, I upload it. You produce data, you upload it, and you all gain from it. Okay. So maybe that's the model which will sustain. We don't know, but someone has to pump prime it. Someone has to pay for all the sensors and infrastructure and things like that. But people are willing to pay for it. That's the question you need to ask yourself. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>